Hello, this is David Thompson from the Fraser Valley in British Columbia with a message for those, all those, that are hungry and thirsty for reality, for ultimate meaning and destiny in your lives. What I am sharing here is not some religious belief to believe in that isn't based in reality. What I am sharing here is reality. It is the very meaning for which all things consist and exist, and that is highly verified from many fields of science and archaeology, and also confirmed by multitudes of people from many backgrounds being converted and having their lives completely transformed throughout history. I am sharing with you that are new the good news that you can know a destiny that is ever enlarging and pleasures of fulfillment in the family of God in heaven. I have a website at ultimatemeaning.com. There, there's a flip book that I've written which answers some of the hardest questions, actually the very hardest questions that people could ask about the truth, about reality. And I have very unique answers given to me by the gifting of the Spirit of God to many hard questions. And also, the print that is highlighted in red are links to many YouTube videos that are very profound and amazing showing from many fields of science and archaeology the reality of what I am about to share here. So go to ultimatemeaning.com and look at that flip book and the YouTube videos. There's also a whole set of YouTube videos on there that explain very clearly who the one true eternal God could only possibly be, what reality is, what truth is, in a very integral definition very scientific definition. You can check that out. This message is for all those that have come to know the one true God for whom to know is life eternal through Jesus Christ. It is a mes message that is specifically to the churches throughout Canada and throughout United States, but also around the world. I speak these messages prophetically. The Word of God says in 1 Peter 4.11, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. That's referring to believers, <coughs> those that are the true followers of the one true and living God. We are to always seek to allow God to speak through us to one another, to edify one another out of the love of God. <coughs> I have a little bit of a cold I'm getting over, so pardon the brief interruptions here and there. So, what I do to allow God to speak through me is I seek to be in a heart and a mindset of worship while I am speaking. The Word of God says in Revelations 19.10, Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When we worship God in spirit and in truth out of a pure heart, in love for God, and great reverence for God, we are filled with a spirit and an overflow beyond ourselves that results in creative utterances that come from the spirit of God. So I will seek to speak out of a heart set and a mindset of worship because that releases an overflow coming through me from the Spirit of God to speak what God is saying to the churches in this particular day and time. And one of the things I do to facilitate that is I cast lots using two independent random applications to get the possibility of any chapter from the Word of God with each application so that I get two chapters that would bear witness with each other as to the common message and theme of what God is saying. 
the casting of the lot was greatly practiced by the church before the time of Christ through the nation of Israel. It was also used in the early church to choose the apostle who would take the place of Judas that betrayed Christ. It was practiced in very great, powerful movements of revival like the Moravian Revival, which even chose their wives by the casting of the lot and many other things. So it is very scriptural, and I do it with great reverence, and you will see from what I have received by the casting of lot that it is well beyond coincidence when this happens over and over again. So, please don't get religious on me. Be real. People get into religious mindsets. And out of their pride, they'll say, Oh, you can't do that. Oh, God doesn't do that. When you do things with a pure heart and genuine faith, God works. If your life is pure and right with God and you're walking in his spirit and in a right love, love relationship with him. So I want to share with you what I received this week by the casting of Lot. But before I do, I also seek to pick a song. Also through the casting of Lot. And I do have a whole list of worship songs on my website at loverealize.com and also at ultimatemeaning.com. I think it's around 149. Many of them are really good songs. There's the odd one that may not be that great, but there are many high quality songs, unlike the typical church services that we go to in this time and age, whether they're charismatic or Pentecostal or evangelical or whatever you want to call it, there's so many churches nowadays, they sing this modern music that's so shallow. That doesn't mean that there aren't modern songs that have depth and meaning and are really good. But overall, there's a lot that aren't. And I've gone to many churches, charismatic churches, where they sing the, almost the same songs every week. A handful of songs. The lack of creativity in the body of Christ is amazing. And one of the reasons for that is because people are not facilitated to move in the gifts of the Spirit in the congregation before the pastor speaks. They are not strongly encouraged. They are not strongly facilitated to. And in fact, in most cases, it's not done at all. Or if you want to say something, you have to ask permission to use the mic. This is not the way it was in the early church. This is not the way God wants it. He wants to move through each member of the body in the gifts of the Spirit, especially in these last days. But because the church is asleep, this is the state of the church. Lack of creativity in those songs is because there's a lack of the gifts of the Spirit moving in the body of Christ. And I'm a voice to the nation of Canada and United States and around the world that God is calling for a new order in the body of Christ. Where we do not limit the fullness of the headship of Jesus Christ from fully inhabiting the local assembly. I've even written a book on it which you can get on Amazon. It's titled, God Had Chip and Body Invasion. I wrote it out of the urgency of realizing that the nation where I am, in Canada and the nation of the United States, the main important key to conquering the nation with the gospel so that we are not on the verge of this impending judgment, which is obvious if you're watching the right news sources, which are links on both of my websites that I've mentioned, on the home page, a little ways down, high quality news links that you can look at where the people don't give you lies. They have everything properly sourced, they're integral. And if you knew what was going on right now, you would know that we are on the verge of great, of 
great shakings of judgment. And God wake us up. We should have been awakened a long time ago if we were walking in the light as he is in the light, if we weren't asleep with the loves of the world. And in this book, God, Headship, and Body Invasion, I share what you can do in your local assembly. For example, forget about pre-service prayer meetings. Hardly any people come to them anyhow, right? The church service starts as a prayer meeting. That's the normal pattern. My house shall be called a house of prayer. We come on our faces before God and on our knees in reverence and awe in these last days. Oh my, your church service should at least have a half an hour prayer, if not an hour. And that should be part of the church service. We should become more conscious of Christ in our midst. And how does that happen? When we're on our knees in reverence and awe before God out of the genuine fear of God. Maybe at first people are praying quietly to themselves, but then maybe after 10 minutes, one feels the spirit rising in them to pray out. They pray out. Everyone seeks to be one with them and says whatever, amen, or whatever. And another prays out and another prays out. Sometimes the spirit leads us to be still and wait on him out of awe of whose presence we're in. And soon the presence of God begins to, to distill in the members of the body as dew in their hearts with revelation and the touching of the Spirit of God. And out of that rises a song and another worship song. And yes, a gift of word is given here of exhortation. Someone feels they have a seed thought from God and they sing it out not knowing what they're going to sing, and it becomes a beautiful song. Another gives a word of exhortation, another word of knowledge, another a testimony, another a prayer, and each member functions in the body as it ought to, effectually, fully encouraged, fully facilitated, but no, nowadays we're all passive, waiting for the performance at the front. And more conscious of that than of Christ in our midst. And God is calling his house to be a house of prayer again. And it is out of that prayer and reverence and awe of God that comes forth the gifts of the Spirit. And yes, I would cast lots and I would have hundreds of high quality songs with meaning and depth like I have on my website. Oh, sometimes you get these people that want to play their instruments at the front, but are they moving in the Spirit? Let's pray they are. Because when you move in the Spirit like they did in the time of King David, where they had the singers, they prophesied. Because the Spirit of God moved on them as they were playing those instruments. <coughs> God is wanting all of his people to prophesy and to edify one another. My, you have so many songs nowadays where you got to pay people money to even have them on your screens. Is that not defilement? Does that not hinder? Why isn't the congregation creative and making up their own songbooks with their own songs? Maybe one has a gift of composing music, another has a gift of making a poem or something that they want in the form of a song, and they go to another brother and say, could you put this into music? And you form your own songbooks. God is wanting a mighty reformation to come in the body of Christ in these last days that will fulfill John 17 and Acts 4.12 and Ephesians 4. Acts 4.12 says, Whom the heavens must receive until the restitution of all things, speaking of Jesus Christ. <coughs> And he's calling us to wake up and to repent of loving the world.
which is the reason the body of Christ is in such a state as it is in, generally speaking, in charismatic churches and evangelical churches across this nation. There should even be three days of fasting and prayer to seek God in your local cities and communities across this nation to repent of loving the world, the gods of amusement, pleasure. People spend hours watching sports and hardly pray and seek God. That's not what God wants. Where is your heart? Where your heart is, there is your treasure. He's calling his people to repent of the gods of amusement, of the pleasure, of materialism, of the things that they have their life focused on. They cause a hardness so that there's no love in their hearts. When the word of God commands us to love one another fervently and to receive one another as Christ received us, not to have a denominative, religious, judgmental spirit towards one another. Because you believe a certain way in another church, you give them the cold shoulder, oh, this is the way we are here. Oh, you're coming to visit us, but our denomination feels, well, they won't say it, they'll say, oh, I love you, brother, but you can feel the distancing. You can feel the lack of love. We don't wash one another's feet, so to speak, spiritually, out of the love of God. And we should literally do it at times to humble ourselves before one another and to break down the hardness. God is calling his people to wake up in this hour and to seek him. And so I want to... Um, bring forth some songs here and so I'm going to bring forth the first one that the Lord actually gave me by the casting of the lot and then another one and may it be a blessing to you because these are beautiful songs and then I will preach the word of God oh I could share a lot more about all that he's wanting to bring back to the body of Christ. But it's in my book there. You can get it on Amazon. I do have another book which I've written, which is on the afterlife, and I'm going to improve it even more with some other things in it soon. Afterlife, Incredibly Irrefutable. It's 368 pages of a large 6 by 9 paperback. You can get it on your phone or a digital device will help support me in the vision and passion I have to see the body of Christ wake up across the nations, especially here in Canada, especially in the United States, that we would turn back to God and seek him, and that we would never go back to being the church the way we were, but that we would wake up and come into this new order that does not limit the fullness of the headship of Jesus Christ. This is God's passion, is the fulfillment of John 17. So I want to share with you now these songs, so we will go to what I received here. Now I know in my spirit I have this one, but the first one I actually received. And I will minimize myself in a moment. It's probably... Best for me to play this one first. Maybe I'll decide whether I should play two or not. So we'll start with this. I'll minimize myself in a moment. Take to all my problems as the force 
night as planned When restricted in pursuing No disquiet will be said Underneath thy faithful deed Not a murmur or that and I will just go to the other song I did receive here quickly on my website under worship songs which maybe is over here under worship songs and it's the one that is prepare you the way of the Lord is what is the zeal of the Lord for the last days. It is indeed that all flesh should see the salvation of God, that his house should be in such a state in local assemblies across this nation, small, in between, and great, that the mountains are brought down and the valleys are raised up, and the crooked places are made smooth, and the rough places straight, so that the glory of God comes into your midst and is seen by the world, which is what God, through Jesus Christ, prayed in John 17. What did Paul the Apostle say? 
He says that God has given more abundant honor unto the part that lacked, so that there should be no schism in the body of Christ. What does that mean? What that means is that when God is allowed to have his way because the leadership gets out of the way and becomes sensitive to Christ the head to facilitate his moving in the body and allows each member of the body to function as God has chosen it to be in the last days. It means that God will put a more greater supernatural gift on those that tend to be looked down on, that aren't so charismatic, etc., to bring down the pride of those that tend to be looked up to by man because they are naturally attractive and charismatic or whatever it is. <coughs> This breaks the spirit of pride, which is what brings about division. For pride, as the Word of God says in Proverbs, comes by contention. And God in these last days wants us to come into the secret place of the Most High, to abide under the shadow of the Almighty, out of returning to the genuine fear of God. And he's calling the church to return to that genuine fear of God. The genuine fear of God will not limit God in moving in the assembly. And God is calling us to a place where we walk in that place of humility and integrity before God, which is birthed out of the genuine fear of God. And I could go into an in-depth teaching on the fear of God, but I'm not here to do that at this time particular time. I want to go into what I've received from the Word of God this week by the casting of Lot, and I don't know what I'm going to share. I don't even remember everything I received this week, but I have all the scriptures pasted in. <coughs> and so, we will turn <coughs> to the scriptures that I received <clears throat> Soon this cold will be over with and I'll be back to normal. <clears throat> so, beginning on Monday, I received Leviticus 22 and Philippians 3. And I point out, and I say here, I, this was just put through typing through the mic, there may be mistakes. <clears throat> it says, when we count all the loves of the world as dung, for the excellency of knowing God through Christ, we do not defile ourselves with the impure things of this world. Rather, we walk in holiness, which is to walk in purity. And really, one of the things I notice through different things that are coming through this week is that God is emphasizing receiving his word in such a way that we come forth with that word incarnated into our lives in a life that is pure, that walks in holiness. And that is what God is saying by his Spirit. I want to point out some of the scriptures here now for Leviticus 22. It says here, Whosoever toucheth any creeping thing whereby he may be made unclean, or a man of whom he may take uncleanness, whatsoever uncleanness he hath, the soul which hath touched any such shall be unclean until evening, and shall not eat of the holy things unless he wash his flesh with water. And it goes on, and when the sun is down, he shall be clean. And, it, and it's different ceremonial laws here about cleanness. And then what paralyzed, parallels that is the chapter I received by Lot in Philippians. Yet doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Christ. 
we are to learn what it is to count all things done. Now, do we hold things precious? Do I hold things precious in my life that I desire? Yes, I'm human. I'm still single. I would like to have a wife. I'd like to have the experience of a partner in ministry, someone to share with, someone to pray with. And yes, to have physical fulfillment with in submission to God. God has created those things to be enjoyed. He created all of these things, but to be in submission to him. But counting them as dung in comparison to knowing Christ, well, that's not just something that we can just enter into by human grit and will or by trying to have this mindset. Although we should seek to have such a mindset always by the turning of our heart unto God. But it is as we persevere that we know the truth and the truth sets us free from the tendencies to hold on to lying vanities. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. We learn not to here and there be sidetracked or hypnotized temporarily by something that we like. It's like a dog being yanked up off the ground because he always puts his nose in the ground and the master keeps yanking his head up. He's only wanting to sniff down there. But eventually there is a place where that dog enters in or like a horse bucking the rider eventually is broken in. It is as we persevere to seek to be in the Spirit that through the Spirit we mortify the deeds of the body. What we need to see is how important purity is. The purity of knowing God instead of being drawn by lying vanities that will dissipate us with those things that tend towards death instead of to life. Because God wants us to be filled with the life and the fullness of the life of his spirit. And so Christ said, except a corn of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now we don't die easily, many of us. But they that have been forgiven much, love much. And the first shall be the last or the last shall be the, pardon me, the last shall be the first. Speaking of the publicans and harlots, that they go into the kingdom of God before you. Because they came to a place of seeing their undoneness and repented before God. And they saw the emptiness of the vanities that they were pursuing. That doesn't mean that someone that comes from a righteous background cannot enter into the same relationship as them. Indeed, it is so that it does happen. God is asking us to be those that are found in Christ, not having our own righteousness. Oh, yeah, which is of the law. Oh, is there a lot to unpack there? You know, the law didn't exist until the time of Moses. In the pre-flood world, there wasn't the Ten Commandments or the ceremonial laws. In the time of Abraham, there wasn't the Ten Commandments or the ceremonial laws. But the righteousness which is of the law can exist among Christians today. They can take the letter of the law in the New Testament even. And they can try in their own strength to do religious things, and we know certain people make certain rules just like they did, the Pharisees did, rules that weren't written in the Word of God. But what did Paul the Apostle say? He says, in essence, I'm not quoting him exactly, he says, we are free and have liberty to do all things. 
but I will not be brought under the power of any of it. Are we a slave to the things of this world, such as spending hours watching sports instead of a life of prayer? Such, now I like to be in good shape. I do workouts. And at my age of 74, it's a great benefit to me. Or I would be a mess by now if I didn't. Is that wrong? No. I don't make that my focus. I don't overdo it. I exercise and discipline myself a bit each day so that my body's in good health. That's not wrong. That's not what God is speaking about here. He's speaking about us being totally controlled by the Spirit of God and by a love relationship with God that brings all of these other things in their proper submission to his will. So people can become religious and condemn you because you go and do a workout and that's supposed to be some terrible thing and yet these same people will spend hours watching sports and hardly have a life of prayer and be in a lukewarm church. The same ones that will religiously condemn you because you, and I've had people do that. And I say to myself, how in the world are you so religious to do such a thing? Look at where a person's heart is at. Don't judge by outward appearance. But the issue is this. Are we entering into a relationship with God where if ever we're in a situation, like in my normal life pattern, I will have certain disciplines like workouts and so on. But if God calls me suddenly to be in a place of ministry where I don't have time to do it, then I let those things go because that's not where my heart is at. My heart is in a relationship with God to fulfill his calling and his purpose in my life. We are not to be found in our own righteousness, which is of the law. And the law is where we get our focus on believing that if we perform this and this, that we have, which is our concept of what God is pleased with, our concept of the law, then God will be pleased with us, but it's performance. It's not from the heart. It's the same mindset as Cain. Cain, in some measure, was unthankful because of the consequences of this curse. He was focused on all the terrible things that happened in his own life, all the terrible suffering around him, that was the consequences of God's Holiness, which is the integrity of his love that will not tolerate what is contrary to love, that requires judgment in all that is contrary to love. And so, he was having a mindset that was a wrong perception, that was not perceiving the holiness of God as good because his focus was on the consequences and how terrible it was that God was allowing all these things. The same thing happened to Job. The enemy is trying to tempt him not to fear God. To get a wrong perception of God is what destroys the fear of God. Because the fear of God is acknowledging that God in his severity towards us as his children to deal with the corruption in our lives is good. And the consequences around us of suffering is not from God, but is from our wrong choices. The holiness or the integrity of God's love is good. As I often say, God's love, the agape love, is a quality that always chooses the highest lasting good over any lesser choice. Because any lesser choice is such would have a measure of corruption in it. God's love is so pure. It is so pure. It is a consuming fire of purity that will not tolerate the slightest that is contrary to this love that always chooses the highest lasting good.
don't mistake his love for you in chastising you as that he doesn't love you. That's the lie that Cain bought into. That's the lie that says, oh, okay, if I do these things, surely God will accept me and be pleased with me. There is our own righteousness. There is the law. What the God gave the law in the context of the commandment to love him with all our heart and mind and being and strength so that we are not focused on our own performance through our perception, wrong perception of the law, which is out of our own righteousness. The right perception of the law is the right perception of God, which is the genuine fear of God that chooses to recognize the holiness of God as good and that we are undone and that apart from his mercy, we cannot make it. That doesn't hire weaknesses from God and try to justify those weaknesses by performance, but rather brings our weakness to God, as it says in the word of God, we're to come boldly to the throne of grace. And God is calling us as his people in this hour to come into a love relationship with him, to return back to the genuine fear of God, not to be like Eve that doubted God. The moment she doubted who God was, she had a wrong perception of God and lost the fear of God because the fear of God is a choice to have the right perception of God that he is first of all good in his holiness and righteous in his severity upon our lives and upon this world and the consequences and that we are those that acknowledge him as the potter and therefore we are thankful for his chastisement. We choose to buy of him the gold tried in the fire. It's only when we see how great God's mercy is to us that we can possibly receive his mercy. And we cannot see, see how great his mercy is to us if we haven't first seen how great his holiness is and how pure and wonderful it is and righteous it is and how we fall so short apart from the mercy of God or of the holiness of God that is so beyond us. So God is wanting to teach us the genuine fear of God, which is the right reciprocation, first of all, of God's love in its integrity to judge what is contrary to love, out of which then we can rightly receive the mercy of God. For we will never repent and cry out for mercy if we do not see, first of all, our need of him the pride that is in us, all the things that are contrary to the love of God, the failure to love others, all of these things. And so Paul the Apostle goes on and says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And I could go on expounding this passage. But overall in this passage, there is the emphasis on a walk that is pure, which is paralleled in the Old Testament passages on outward things to be ceremonially and physically pure, which were a picture of our walk. And I could go into that, but there's more that comes by the casting of lot. And so when we go from there, where is Tuesday? My, I don't want to miss Tuesday. Surely I did Tuesday. Maybe I didn't do Tuesday. No, I don't think I did Tuesday. Okay, there was something that happened on Tuesday. So we go to Wednesday, and in, on Wednesday, I received Jeremiah 15 by lot and 1 John 2 by lot. Both of these chapters contrast those that know the truth and God from those who do not and show the love relationship that those that know God have with the Father and the Son. Jeremiah 15, 1, Therefore said the Lord unto me, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind could not be toward this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. And then Jeremiah says this, O Lord, thou knowest, remember me and visit me and revenge me on my persecutors. Take me not away in thy long suffering." Know that for thy sake I have suffered rebuke. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. 
and thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of mine heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord, God of hosts, which in the original would be O Yahweh, the Almighty's of hosts. The word Elohim is Almighty's, referring to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the word Lord, Yahweh or Jehovah, Yahweh being more accurate, is the ultimate reality that is separate above and beyond all creation, the I am that I am. You see that Jeremiah delighted in the word of God. Thy words were found and I did eat them. He's not just taking them into his mind. His heart is receiving it. He's taking it by really deeply into his heart. It's with the heart that we can eat the word of God. We are to learn to, to do that with our inner being, to eat his word, to take it in. And it was unto him the joy and the rejoicing of his heart. And he knows that the Lord knows him, that he is his. He has that strong identity, that deep love relationship with God. He didn't fall into this trap of justifying his own ways by performance like so many of the children of Israel did. He knew a deep identity with the Lord. And I'm not going to go into too much about this. Um, First John 2 is about not loving the world. And it's a very familiar passage. Especially, um, I, I know it so well that maybe I think everyone knows it. It's about not loving the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. That word lust means over desire, basically. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So it's not wrong to have desires, for God has given us all things to enjoy. A wife, you enjoy her emotionally and physically. All of that is fine in submission to the Lord. But it is not the controlling factor in our lives, and we always have to put these things over and over before God on the altar with a very thankful heart. The more we are thankful and recognize that these are just gifts that God has given to us, all the better. And so we, all of us are learning these things to put them before him now, I want to go on because there's so much more here. I could talk for a long time on all of these passages. On Thursday, I received Exodus 3 and Romans 12, and both of these chapters have the common theme of being given as a living sacrifice to the ministry that God is calling us to. Moses had a hard time coming to the place of being committed to go to Egypt to bring Israel out of Egypt, but God showed him that God was with him to perform what seemed impossible. And so that is the account of the burning bush where the Lord tells Moses that he wants him to go to Egypt, and of course Moses makes excuses. And the Lord was angry with him for that, but was merciful and decided to allow Aaron to be his mouthpiece, even though the Lord rebuked him and said, you shouldn't be looking at your mouth like, you know, I can't use your mouth. Who do you, th if I'm commanding you to go, why in the world are you not believing that I can put the words in your mouth, even if you're slow of speech? And so many of us also can 
find ourselves making excuses. But in Romans 12, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, <coughs> which is your reasonable service. <coughs> and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The danger of pride is emphasized in relation to this. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For we... For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So, those that want to be some great apostle or so on, let's be honest and be thankful for what God is calling us to. It may not be some high calling as an apostle or whatever else. But we are to be faithful with what God has given us, recognizing that those that have a higher calling are put through a far greater trials and testings. And so we are thankful for what we are and we think soberly. And Moses was called to a high calling. And as it has been said, he was trained by the Egyptians for 40 years. And then he was brought to a place of as it were, the breaking down of any pride and sufficiency of himself for the next 40 years in the wilderness before he was used for the last 40 years of his life by God. And there's a process before we come to the place where God can send us. It's the same process that Moses went through. A dying to self that we might be brought to that place of being used by the Lord. The same was the case with the patriarchs. It says of Joseph, until his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. And indeed, he was tried severely. The same with Jacob. Jacob became Israel, but he had to go through a process of the unraveling of the deception of self, but he had a passion and a hunger for God. And that was unraveled as he had to face Esau. And then he wrestled with who was Jesus Christ incarnate. And he was called Israel. After that, he shall be a prince of God. And there's going to be a coming time. The time of Jacob's trouble again is coming to Israel as a nation. And it's already beginning right now as we see them facing such a serious crisis it is waking them up to the reality of what are really priorities. It is unraveling all the things in their lives that they thought were important and causing them to turn to God so that these bones and the flesh that has come together now begins to rise up and become an army that is about to be filled with the Spirit of God as prophesied in Ezekiel. What is it, 37? And I think it's about time that Ezekiel 38 and 39 are fulfilled, and I believe we are living at that time, where it is about to be fulfilled to bring in a great harvest of multitudes of souls. For it says there that when all of these armies that come against Israel are destroyed, not only will they be picking up the bones for seven years because of the massive destruction, but it says that all the world will then know that the Lord is God. They will no longer believe in the false gods that they're worshiping at this time. And that's going to bring in a mighty harvest of souls. Which is going to be the harvest mentioned in Revelations 14. And that will happen around the world. Now I have a lot here and I'm not going to read this. God is speaking saying by his spirit that he wants us to be ready to be sent like Moses was sent. Are we willing 
to be like Moses and to go against unspeakable odds to do what God is calling us to do in these last days as individuals and also as the body of Christ. And certainly the least we can do is not limit God in our assemblies anymore and turn from loving the world and wake up and become everything he's called us to be. Now I want to go to the next passage. Which I received on Friday, yesterday. And all of these are amazing passages. This one is quite amazing what I got by the casting of Lot. Both of these two chapters are about Noah. In relation to doing what is lawful in the sight of God to show respect and not look on impurity, especially sexually. Before the law and Genesis 9, it states that Canaan committed that which was unlawful in the sight of God. This is emphasized in 2 Peter 2. It says that they committed those things that were unlawful, and this was before the law. So they knew what was unlawful before the law. And so I'm going to read this passage here. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread, and Noah began to be a husbandman. And he planted a vineyard, and he drank the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw... <coughs> <coughs> the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without, and Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And God shall no and, and God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So what happens here is that it was it's obvious from this that Canaan must have taken the clothes that were covering Noah off when he was drunk. And Ham then saw it, which was his father, and instead of turning away and doing what Japheth and Shem did, he looked at it and said, whoa, look at this. There was no respect for Noah by Canaan. He did an act that was disrespectful, and it was understood before the law that this was a very unlawful thing to do to see the nakedness of your own family. So this was probably also in the pre-flood world, obviously, since they are straight from the pre-flood world. Before the law, they recognized there were certain things that were disrespectful and irreverent and impure and would draw one into corruption and impurity. And therefore, they did not allow themselves to look on these things to observe lying vanities. <clears throat> and it goes on here, and there's other things that are mentioned in Genesis 9 that to me were significant. It talks about Genesis 9, 3 to 7, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. This is after the flood. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require, at the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, and at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. 
So if you kill an animal and it's not for the purpose of eating food and just for pleasure, he's going to require the blood of that animal at your hand. That seems to be what it's saying here. That the two things that are not allowed are to kill something, except it's for the purpose of eating it, and also that you're not allowed to eat something with blood in it because blood is the medium that contains the soul. And when the blood is out poured out of something, the soul is released from the body. The life, the word life there is the word soul. The soul of the flesh is in the blood. The soul influences the blood and the influences of whether obedience unto God or disobedience unto God affects the genetics of the blood to the following generations. So that some will have a greater proneness towards wickedness than others. That's why it talks about a wicked seed in Isaiah that God will judge. Those that are very prone to wickedness and tend to reject the gospel and not to receive it as a whole, as a people or a nation. And so I just point out some of these things. Now in Second Peter, which is the other passage I received that day, it says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them unto chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that afterward should live ungodly. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their, what does it say? Unlawful deeds. This is before the law. There was no one what was unlawful, what was contrary to God, such as homosexuality and all of these other things being given to lust to the flesh. The temporal vanities, instead of submitting their lives to God and fearing God, God wants us to love purity in these last days and to not be led into lying vanities. And he's calling us to be those that will guard the issues that are in our heart of our thought life. For out of the heart, it says we're to guard our heart with all, all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And I have many times when I have to come before God and repent because I've entertained thoughts being single of lust towards a woman or whatever else. It happens. Not a lot. I try to always control you know, bring my thoughts, but I have had times where I've had to really repent. And it's not wrong to have those desires. It's wrong to have those desires control you. No, we are controlled by the Spirit of God. We submit our lives to Him. There's so much here I don't want to overdo it, sharing. And I received today Deuteronomy 14 and Genesis 7, which is about Noah again. Deuteronomy is again about this thing that I've been talking about. This is the overarching theme. It's about receiving the word of God in such a way that we come forth incarnated into a pure relationship with God in our lives. And so here we see different Animals that are told not to be eaten. Why? For example, every beast that parteth the hoof and cleave the cleft into two claws and cheweth the cut among the beasts, that shall ye eat. Now the hoof speaks of our walk. It speaks of a walk that is in the paths of righteousness. And the chewing speaks of those that receive with their heart the word of God. But as we go on, we have various descriptions here. 
Nevertheless, these ye shall not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the cloven hoof, as the camel and the hare and the coney, for they chew the cud, but they divide not the hoof. So there are those many people, oh, we're really into the word of God here. Yes, we're into the word of God, but we don't live it. We're given over to either a legalistic life or a life that is immoral, where we justify equating godliness with material wealth, the false prosperity gospel or the false grace gospel, and we're becoming like the church of Laodicea. You're either becoming like the church of Laodicea in these last days or the church of Philadelphia, where there's genuine love because we're not in love with the world. We're in love with the beauty that comes out of God. It's pure love. It is so pure. It is the very source of beauty. Worship God in the beauty that is out of holiness, which is the integrity of God's love, that is so pure in his love for us. He gave his life as a living sacrifice. There's nothing more beyond comprehension about that. It's amazing that God's love could be that great. And the swine, because it divideth the hoof, yet cheweth not the cud. So here we have someone, that, I walk a very holy, legalistic life. But it doesn't, how does it take the word of God in the swine? It's a hog, it hogs everything up, just swallows it any old way, doesn't take it to heart. Oh, I love hearing all these sermons. How many people I know that like hearing an eloquent, wonderful spiritual preacher and they can watch spiritual programs all the time on the internet? Oh, I like to hear this preacher and that. They don't take it hard. God is wanting us to be those that take to heart seriously the word of God so that it is incarnated into our lives. and doesn't come out in a lifestyle that shows shame to the world because we look so religious on the one hand because we're so legalistic or on the other hand are so deceived and corrupt and immoral filled with covetousness and not an example to the world or a light to the world. It says when the Antichrist takes over Concerning the church that will be there at that time, towards the end of the reign of the Antichrist, it says in Revelations, I believe it is 16, it says, Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Are we going to be those that are like this swine here? that misrepresent the glory of God because they don't see the glory of God in our midst. They see the church of Laodicea. God is calling us to wake up, brothers and sisters, in this last hour. And of course, in First Thessalonians, it talks about walking worthy of God who has called you onto his kingdom and glory. We were just talking about these animals with the hoofs and their walk. We are to walk worthy of God who has called us unto his kingdom and glory. And so that's the emphasis there I want to point out. You see, the apostles lived the life. It says, ye are witnesses in God also, how holy and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe, as ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of man, but as 
in truth the word of God. It's a matter of how we're receiving the word of God. And that is what God is asking in this week, is that we be those that come open to fully receiving the full counsel of God, the full word of God into us by making our priorities his kingdom above everything else. And it goes on to say, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And it goes on. And I will just leave it at that. Thank you for listening to this message. God bless you all.